Well, it's spring break here in the U.S., so I'm wondering if everybody is on vacation. Might be a small group today, but I am recording, so I'll... If you don't mind being in the video or having your voice in the video, feel free to go ahead and share anytime. If you, well, let me get my screen shared here. Okay. If you don't want to be in the video or have your voice heard, then just put your question in the chat. Okay. There we go. And this little um, code here is just in case anybody has a question and they don't want to have their name associated with it. Sometimes we get people who are very hesitant about AI and they're afraid that they uh, might somehow be associated with something that's unaccepted by some academics. And so it's always good to have that option. Even though everything we do, we feel is ethical, ethics are, you know, relative, I guess. And so I'm just giving people an option to use that code if they want to be anonymous with their questions. All right. So as always, we will, I'll share a little info about AI and AI literacy, and then I will do a demo and then we will open it up for Q&A. And I'm just getting my coffee poured here. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Because it's spring break, my kids are home, my husband's home, and my mom is visiting. So it's a little bit crazy in my house today. All right. So today I want us to talk about bias and ethical considerations related to some critical AI literacy that I think is really important. There was a new research article that just came out, and this is in my exact field, Applied Corpus Linguistics. This is the method that I have used multiple times in studies. It's called multidimensional analysis. It's a statistical method with looking at linguistic texts and their features and how their features align. And it basically is a factor analysis, but I won't get into all that. What, what I want to say about this is that some pretty cool findings have come out from this research. The author compared AI-generated versus human-authored text, a big corpus of both, and it was using GPT 3.5. Unfortunately, this is indicative of how long it takes to publish good scientific research. By the time we publish the good research, the technology has moved on. And so now, of course, we have GPT-4, we have Gemini 1.5, we have Claude 3. And I suspect that some of these results would have been mitigated or been better with some of these more advanced models. But anyway, I mean, I'm what it what they found regardless, because I think that it has some really important implications for AI detection. So the findings are here. The first major finding is that the AI was not able to produce natural conversation. So it was like overly formal. That dialogue just didn't sound natural. If you've ever asked an AI to generate something that was like oral language rather than written, you would probably find the same thing. It's overly formal. It sounds very stilted, sometimes even old fashioned. And then the second important finding, I think, is that AI lacked persuasive elements in genres like op-eds, so opinion articles for newspapers. So one pretty cool thing about this study is it looked at different um, registers or text types. So conversation was one, news was one, and then academic language was one, and there may have been some other ones. But it kind of missed the mark, as I said, in conversation because it was overly formal. It missed the mark in op-eds because it wasn't quite persuasive enough. So that argumentative element that we might expect to see in the writing wasn't there. I guess I put this one in twice. The, the particularly bad at mimicking conversation. I already said that up here. The third finding is that academic AI writing underutilized context-dependent references. So it populated citations, but they weren't really well connected to the other pieces of the language that were occurring right there, wherever the reference was generated. And this is particularly problematic, of course, and this because some people really do use ChatGPT as a research tool. They use it to generate academic text. And, and so one problem with that is that it could hallucinate the, the author and hallucinate the findings. But beyond that, it just wasn't a very natural way to input a reference. 
which is hard for any writer. I mean, academic writers have to learn how to do this and learn how to do it well. But the AI, and again, this was GPT 3.5, wasn't doing that very well. So those were the main findings. And I think one thing that was not in the article, but is very much a part of my world is this idea of AI detection. Um, We know, not from this article, but we know that other evidence points to inaccuracy of these detectors. They tend to identify text written by speakers of other languages, for example. But what I think is really important here is that this study found that the ability for a language model to generate authentic human-sounding text was connected to genre-based patterns. So this idea that like, depending on the type, we change our language. And when we don't change our language, we sound inauthentic. We don't sound like we are fluent in that particular style. And so that's what's happening here with the model. It wasn't able to get the genre styles and patterns right. So if that's the case, it means that an AI detector would need to be sensitive to a text type divergence. So if a text, if a if a if any text is being generated by a human or by an AI, if that person or that generator is not familiar with those conventions, then it's not going to sound authentic. Immediately it's going to be tagged as potentially AI written. So this is why I think this article, which didn't mention AI detection at all, really has quite a lot of implications for this. I'm not a fan of AI detection, as you all know. We we often tell people not to use it, but almost every question that we get from users is related to this. It's like, well, if I use your tools, will I be reported because of this AI detection issue? And especially overseas, I think it it's happening quite a lot. People just aren't accustomed to the technology. And so that leads me to another new uh, article. This is not a study. This is just a comment article. I love these these articles in journals. This, this is a different uh, type of academic writing. It's not research writing. It's, it's just almost like an op-ed. It's a commentary. Sometimes they're called evaluative articles where uh, an academic just writes in and gives their opinion or their ideas about something that's happening, usually in that discipline or in, in that world of that methodology at the time. And this article came out in The Lancet, which is one of the most well-respected medical journals of all time. And this author argues that society is struggling anytime we have some sort of exponential change. And this is called the pet aver- aversion trap, if you if you want to look that up. But basically, whether it's a virus or a new technology or anything else that kind of hits us, some big political change, for example, we have this difficulty in understanding it and in making sense of the implications fast enough to actually do something about it. And so if you're here, you know, you're an early adopter of AI, you're at the cutting edge. I mean, but many, many people aren't. And he goes on to say that the reason this is particularly problematic in scientific publishing is because there's a gap between technological progress and institutional adaptation. So whether it's higher ed or whether it's a publishing company, there's this huge gap between what's happening with the tech and what's happening with the adoption of the tech. And so as that gap grows, we see many problems happening, adoption with its application. And he says this is really dangerous because right now what's happening is we have this inconsistent AI guidance in publishing. So 24% of top academic publishers versus 87% of scientific journals had guidance. So the journals are getting out there and giving some guidance, but the publishers like textbook publishers are not. So yeah, there's some other statistics there about disclosure criteria, which means you're required to explain when you use that. But the article concludes by saying that these are signs that suggest, and this is the words that the author used, 
things are not going to be okay with generative AI and scientific publishing. And I have struggled with this personally, I mean, professionally, but but as a, as a writer and a researcher, because I have, for example, a study right now, and I'm trying to get it published. It got rejected from the first journal. And so I found a second journal and their requirements say absolutely no copywriting can be done by generative AI because the human must validate everything. Well, from my perspective, those two things aren't mutually exclusive. I can generate something with AI and I can validate it. So that statement doesn't even make sense to me. So that puts me in the position of, do I send an email to this editor and and say, hey, I use generative AI to help me write this abstract or to brainstorm potential implications. If they believe that this is wrong and I'm outing myself, I'm risking being rejected by this journal because of something, because of a difference of opinion about what it means to validate output, I guess. So this is really top of mind for me because I am still researching and publishing and I'm I'm concerned that some academics have their heads in the sand and they just aren't paying attention to what's happening. And it's, it's going to be problematic. One thing is like, it's really sped up. It's for me, it's sped up my ability to get research finished and out there. And they already are slow and behind, as we saw with the previous article where they're just now publishing linguistic research about GPT 3.5, and we've already moved way on. So that bottleneck is going to get more and more difficult, I think. So I'm just curious, like, why else do you think, I mean, is there anything you want to add? And again, I'm recording this. And so if you don't mind being in the recording, which I'm going to put on YouTube, feel free to, you know, unmute and share that, or you can put it in the chat. Or if you want to be anonymous, I can give you the, I can go back. Let me see. If you want to be anonymous, you can use this QR code to share something without your name. So I'll just give you a minute to just think about that. And if nobody has anything, we can just move on. I was going to say that, hey, Kim, I'll say people fear what they don't understand, you know, and then uh, corresponding uh, actions to to line up with that. Yep. Just a thought. Yep. And Rick wrote another term would be the diffusion of innovation curve. Yeah. And there's been, there's a lot of research that's been done on like how long it takes people to adopt things and, and that curve of adoption. And, and yeah, there's fear. And I, I do hear people saying we have to give space for that fear and acknowledge it. And I, I believe that too. But at some point, I, I just am afraid there's, there's going to be haves and have nots when it comes to this technology. And not just haves and have nots, but kind of a, people who don't know how to use it at all and who are being, who are, who are then put in a, put at a disadvantage. So one, one other way that we can think about this is this is the SAMR model for technology in educational settings. And so there's kind of four stages and they are supposed to get increasingly more complex. And we talked about this uh, last week a little bit, but each level represents a different degree of technology use and an impact on educational practices. And so, you know, we've got direct substitute one for one. So instead of writing with a pencil, you type, you know, um, would be a good example. And then augmentation would be some sort of functional improvement over the original, like using a a word processor to write documents, which gives you like spell check and grammar suggestions. Modification is when the task is significantly changed or redesigned. So for example, when students work collaboratively in a Google Doc to collectively write or compose something, that would be an example of a modification in the writing task. And then finally, at the top here, and the one that I want to talk about is this redefinition, which enables the creation of a completely new task that was previously inconceivable. And this might be something like virtual virtual reality environments to simulate and explore or, you know, for example, like in a scientific way, some some healthcare issue to train nurses or doctors. But 
just in a simpler way, large language models and generative AI allow us to write in ways that we never were able to write before. And so we have scholars now talking about this, the, this idea of post-plagiarism. So writing in the age of artificial intelligence, this is comes from work by Sarah Eaton. She's a Canadian researcher and her her main focus is on academic integrity. And I love this um, graphic. I, we use it all the time at AI Lab when we do webinars and professional development. But the six tenets are hybrid human AI writing will become normal. And so we won't be worried about detecting it anymore because plagiarism itself will be completely redefined, you know, which is really exactly what this says, redefinition, a whole new way to think about what does writing mean? So yeah, we have human AI writing coming normal, human creativity being enhanced, language barriers overcome. Already, I think one thing publishers can expect is for, they don't, they probably are not going to need to hire editors. I don't know if you've ever published anything, but they have this little, they always have an option for you to pay a lot of money to get your writing edited because many scientists live overseas, speak English as an extra language. And so the grammar, the vocabulary, sometimes it isn't quite right, but the the science itself and the content is is strong. And so this excites me because I think we're going to be able to allow researchers in, in countries where English is not the dominant language to publish because it has nothing. To, obviously, the, you, you can speak any language and do really good science. And so this idea as a linguist, this really appeals to me that I'm hoping science can be published from lots of other places besides just English dominant countries. Humans relinquish control, but not responsibility. So we are going to have to give up some sense of like every single word has to be written by a human because we're writing in tandem now with a machine. Attribution is always going to stay important, especially in the realm of academic writing, science writing. And then finally, and this is where the title comes from, historical definitions of plagiarism may no longer apply. So we may have to really rethink and transcend our ideas of what it means to, to plagiarize. So yeah, this is, I think this is really important right now happening in, in the world. And, and these are some things from, from my field that are, are really kind of top of mind. So with that, I want to, I just want to do a brief, if you've ever attended a webinar of ours, we talk a lot about prompt design. And so there's a couple things to remember about prompt design. And I'm just going to hit some really high points really quickly, because when I demo a tool today, I would love for you to join me and pull that same tool up and let's like work on it together. And I want us to try some different prompting techniques and for this to be really interactive. So first of all, when you prompt, you want to hit three main points. You want to talk to the to the ch chatbot about its role and the goal. So what expertise should it use? Who's the target audience? And then what process or insights do you want that machine to use? So I will often use the phrase act as a, and then a fill in the blank. Like if I'm doing something for the website or a blog post or, you know, social media, I might say act as an expert marketer because I'm not a marketer. So I don't have access to that that kind of language. And so I want to really pull that out of the machine or act as a scientific editor. Sometimes I ask like act as a business expert when I have a business question or I need to think through something from that perspective. So role and goal. And then context, what's the context or setting for the interaction between the human and the tool? So, you know, what kind, what are we talking about? Where and when is this happening? Are we imagining a time in the future, in the past? Is this present moment? What's the setting? Is it formal? Is it informal? You know, what are the actual descriptors of that context? And that can be really extensive or it can be very brief. Obviously, if I'm just getting help writing an email, I don't go into a lot of context and setting. I just say, help me revise this email for clarity or something like that. 
And then output. And this is where I think we can get a lot of fun stuff out of the LLM. So for, and, and I've divided this into two columns here, form and function. So form is like, what should it look like when it comes out? Is it going to be paragraphs? Is it going to have headings, tables, bullets, other tables, getting an LLM to generate a, a table, like a matrix is my favorite thing to do because it really helps me to understand and put things into a graphic perspective. And every time I tell people that, it blows their mind. Like, oh, I can get it to output a table. Yes. And then you can copy and paste that table into whatever you're working on. And then function. So this is similar to context, but specifically, is it going to be formal, casual? Is it supposed to be persuasive or just informational, argumentative or objective, subjective, flashy? I mean, you could think of lots of different descriptors here for that output and what the style of it would be. And this, to some extent, will mitigate those problems we, we talked about in that linguistic research where the researcher found that in certain genres or or text types, it wasn't able to match the linguistic patterning that a human would use, which and in that case, it's like an expert human, like a, a human who's an expert in writing an op-ed or, you know, having a conversation. So we also have to put that caveat in. But these are kind of just some general things we always teach. And then in case you've heard these, but don't know what they are. So machine learning scientists, computer scientists, forgive me if you're a computer scientist, but their, their ability to name things is not so great. Zero shot just means no examples, very little explanation. So shot means example. So a zero shot prompt is when you just give it a shot and you don't give it very much information, okay? No examples. One shot is when you give it one idea, whether it's an example or an explanation of what's going on. And typing mind, someone put in the chat, typing mind has all these as drop down settings in their prompt interface. Yeah, so if you're interested in prompt engineering, typing mind would be a great place to go. Thanks for that. I didn't know about that. That's a good that's a good resource. So one shot is one example. Few shot is a few examples. And chain of thought is just like a process, like a one, two, three, or it could be first, second, third, or if, then, next, kind of, you know, just like a reasoning uh, process would happen in your brain. So those are just some few, a few things I want you to think about uh, as we move into the demo. And then Expect iterative troubleshooting. So I was working with a woman earlier today and she is a professor and she had asked me to offer a, a rubric for her. It doesn't give quantitative grades, but it outputs feedback and she uses that feedback as a starting point. She takes it and then she changes it to fit what she wants to say to a student about their writing because she's grading. It's a right. It's a huge graduate level writing class and she's grading lots and lots of papers. And so it speeds up her process and it allows her to give more feedback. And she said, it's not doing something right. The tool's not working right. And I said, well, did you tell the tool that it wasn't working right? And she was like, no. And I said, well, you have to tell it. It's just more like a human than a software. You have to directly call out the error. And if it does something you like, you need to say, oh, great. I like that. And tell it, like praise it when it does well and correct it when it doesn't. And I know that sounds and she, we were texting and she just wrote back that emoji with the mind blown, you know, like it worked. It totally worked. So if it ignores you, you need to call that out because they get forgetful. Sometimes if you're doing something over and over again and you've gotten a long conversation going, whatever happened first, the machine may no longer remember that because it uses a summarization formula. We won't get into that, but sometimes it can forget that or it can just kind of lose track, just like a human can lose track. Break down complexity into steps and iterate and reiterate if you're not getting what you want. So those are just some things to remember. Trust but verify is a really good way to think about it. You want to you want to believe that what's coming out is probably right, but you always need to check it. This is a great article. If you haven't followed Ethan Mollick on LinkedIn, he is a great source of information and he has lots of YouTube videos from the University of Pennsylvania at the Wharton School with his wife, Lilac. They do the videos together and they talk specifically about using AI with students, with approaching prompting for educational purposes. 
I've got this down here, but I mean, you can, this is publicly available open access, so you can find this pretty easily. And I believe that they update, they have maybe updated it since then. My understanding is that this is kind of a living, breathing thing that they are updating it. Yeah, it says last revise September 26th. So there's that. And then finally, and then I'll get to my demo. This is a new article that came out with some new prompts that I really like for academia. The first one is called meta language creation. So if you're using a word that may have a specific sense in your discipline, you might say when I use X and X can be a word or a phrase, interpret it as and then give it a definition. So once you tell the machine that it will always treat that word in, in that way. So that's one good thing to do. And then after generating the summary of X or after generating anything, it doesn't have to be a summary, but after generating this, reflect on it and identify any potential inaccuracies or areas that require further clarification. I really like this one because it asks the LLM to go back and look at what it already generated and to consider what is there and what is not there and to identify any areas that could be improved. And then the last one is called a cognitive verifier. These are names that the, these authors gave. This is when you ask the model to generate additional questions or considerations based on the initial query about X or whatever you're doing with it, and then combine the answers to provide a comprehensive analysis of the topic. So it's like, you know, you're, you're, you're pulling it all together and you're synthesizing whatever you've been discussing with the model putting it together at the end. So I really like these and you can do this with our tools from AI Lab. So we've done a lot of prompting on the back end, but you can then engage with the tool further and that's where the really good stuff happens because we can only do so much, but all of you come from different disciplines, you're using different methodologies. And so you really need to have some idea of prompt engineering and know, for example, that you talk to it like a human, you confirm it or you correct it when it's wrong, and that will help you to get better results from our tools. So the demo today is going to be one specific part of the academic or the Lit Review Copilot. And let me just get that pulled up really quickly. And it's about reverse outlining. And somebody here gave me this idea. And the somebody who, who gave me this idea is welcome to identify themselves or not. Let me just get the, well, I guess I'm going to have to completely log in. All right, let me stop sharing this and start sharing my other screen. Okay, so if you're new, if you're new to AI Lab and you haven't logged in yet, or if you haven't logged in enough times to get kind of the hang of it, you're going to go to our website and then go to account and then put in your password and your username. And I'm just going to start. So then you'll see whatever you signed up for. So all of you are paid members. So you're either at the navigator level or the pioneer level. I'm going to go to pioneer and I'm going to go to this literature review co-pilot because what I want to do is this. I want to talk about reverse outlining. So typically when you finish with a lit review for your dissertation or your thesis, if you meet with your professor and they say, well, you kind of, you know, the topics aren't exactly organized quite right. You've got some duplication. It's really hard to write a lit review. I think the lit review is the hardest part of academic writing, research writing. So why don't you do a reverse outline? Well, nobody wants to hear this because a reverse outline is very time because it means that you have to take what you've written and turn it into an outline in a backwards way. Usually when you're writing, you plan with an outline and you kind of write into the outline. But this is flipping that script and having creating an outline from text. Well, an LLM can do that for you to some extent. And so the idea here is that you would do this on your own lit review, but I was working with a certain somebody who is here today, and this person had the idea that they could reverse outline a piece of, of writing by someone else. They could reverse outline, in particular, it was a dissertation. So let's say you're reading and you're preparing for your lit review, and you want to know what are the seminal articles in this field? Well, you can go and look for them, 
Or if someone has published a dissertation or a research article very similar to your topic in the last five years, you would want to know what are they citing, who are the researchers they're citing, and how are they organizing the themes in their literature review. And so you can do that if you generate a reverse outline. So this is Lit Review Copilot, and generate a reverse outline is one of the choices. I'm going to click next, and it's going to ask me to upload a document, and I'm and it's going to do a reverse outline. So I have I have an example lit review here somewhere. Yeah, right here. I'm just going to let it think for a few minutes. So this is the literature review that I wrote for my dissertation, and so I'm quite familiar with this writing and this work so I can verify because I already know because I wrote it what topic what the topics are and what the articles are within those topics. So you can see like the introduction here is an overview of graduate level disciplinary writing. Topic one is the role of published research and the necessity for graduate students to produce varied types of text. In that section, the author, which in this case is me, cited these particular researchers. So if you were writing a dissertation on this same topic, I think this would be a great way for you to start. You see, oh, I see. This person is starting very broad, graduate level disciplinary writing, and, and, and these are the people they're citing. The second topic is the importance of this for this idea of being an insider in your discipline instead of an outsider, which graduate students really are outsiders until they graduate and they become, you know, kind of official or they're gaining, they're moving from novice to expert in that whole process. And so that is kind of a little bit of a narrower topic. So we started big and now we're getting narrower and narrower. Now even more narrow, the importance of thesis and dissertations these are the people that I cited. And so you can see like how I was organizing the topics and the themes. And I've prompted the, the model on the back end to give me a list of anything that was cited in that. So thanks to the person who gave me this idea, because I've been telling everybody, and this is a long lit review, so it goes on and on. And then when you get your results, this is for all of our tools, you always have to click next to get to a screen where you can interact with the bot. So you'll you'll click next and then you'll see this little message, time to chat, don't stop here. You can ask the AI additional questions and engage in dialogue. This is where the real learning happens for you and the real magic with your writing. So I'm gonna click next. And then at this point, let me share this. I'm gonna put the, all of you are members. So I'm gonna put this tool in the chat. So you can access it if you don't want to log in. Ha ha, Jenny. It's it's Jenny. She outed herself. <laughs> yes, Jenny and I had a meeting last week and she had this idea for reverse outlining, not for her own writing, but for someone else's. And it was really a great idea. So now what I want to do is think about, okay, what are some follow-up questions that I might like to ask? Well, if we go back to my slides and we think about this prompting, these ideas of prompting, let's think about this cognitive verifier that I was showing you in that last slide where we asked the uh, bot to generate any additional questions or considerations based on this and combine the answers. So here I'm going to say, act as an expert in disciplinary academic writing and graduate student support. And I'll put a list of topics that seem missing from this particular text. So this now I'm asking it to verify what it read and to come up with different ideas. I don't know why our tools always say certainly, but that's their favorite adverb. Well, certainly I can do this. Yeah. So these are the topics that were not covered in my dissertation. And some of them were not covered on purpose and others of them I did just didn't, I just didn't think about it. For example, challenges faced by international graduate students. I specifically said at some point that that was outside the scope of my study because I used a convenience sample. And while many of them were graduate students, they were international, I couldn't differentiate because I anonymized the data and I couldn't tell. It was all written in English. So I didn't know who was born 
in the U.S. versus born, you know, in another country. So anyway, but digital literacies, this is one that I think if I wrote it again, I would definitely consider this. Interdisciplinary practices, I did talk about this. I don't know why it, it didn't pick up on that. I did not write about mental health. But anyway, this gives me as the writer, if I'm ever going to publish this, other options for how to make this better that I may not have thought about. So that is how you can interact with a tool. If you think that a tool can be used one way and we didn't imagine it to be used that way, it doesn't matter. Use the tool however you think it would work best for you and confirm or correct its output so that you can get better results. Okay, that is really all I have, I believe. Let me just double check my slides here. I do want to say if any of you are having difficulty getting started with the tools, we do have one-on-one -on -one support that you can take advantage of. Let me just share this. So you can always reach out by email. This is our business number and we can do calls or texts. And then if you need some one-on-one -on -one support, like you have a specific use case and you can't figure out how to use the tools, Dissertation by Design, which is our sister company, that's Jessica's consulting business. They offer a a free consult one free consultation. So if you just need help getting started with the tools, you can book a complimentary consultation and they will help you walk through it, make a plan. And that is that is complimentary. It's free, that first one. So that is some other lots of ways that you can get support. And now I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to you. What questions do you have? Okay, let me see in the chat. As an alternative to your prompt, could you simply have a box to tick for gap analysis? We could if we had different tech, if we had like somebody who, well, we do now, we do have some software developers who are working with us to make our tech more robust. But I think, yeah, that would be great. Just click a button and have it do a gap analysis rather than us having to write out that whole prompt. I mean, it's not a big deal, but yeah. So we are hoping soon, like soon within the next month, I would say, to, yeah, to to have some some better features. But also like we learn from you. So if you have these ideas, please share them because we can, now that we have support, we can ask our, our tech development team to add that as a feature. And then someone also said, I would also point out that the format of the document upload uploaded impacts how the tool, yes, how the tool reads it. So if you're uploading a Word document versus a PDF, you might get some different results. Those themes and topics and subheadings that you see, that they might not accurately reflect what's in that document. So you always need to be validating. That's what I say, like trust, but verify. It's not the final decision of a tool to help you understand somebody's research or your own writing. You really need to dig deep and go back and verify that. So yeah, good point. PDF is generally the best format to use. Someone asked, is one format better than the other? PDF is generally the very best form to use because uh, a Word document has a lot of metadata on the back end that PDFs don't have, as I understand it. And so we've had more luck with PDFs. Word documents still work, but PDFs are designed for, you know, cross digital sharing and multiple platforms. And I mean, portable is the P right? Movable. So in multiple different contexts and environments. And if you can get the original format, what do you mean by that original format? Like however it was published? If it is your own document that you are uploading, you won't have as many errors. Yeah. If you're getting a PDF from a publishing company, it's, you know, it's it definitely is something you're going to need to check because some PDFs aren't, I don't know if you've ever tried to copy and paste from a PDF. But this is an easy way to see. Sometimes there's like layers of text, one on top of the other. And so you can't always pull out the text exactly as you would want to. So that's, I believe that's what she's referring to there. If you can, if you have your own document, it's always going to be easier. Well, what else is going on? We don't have to talk about this particular tool or this, anything that I've talked about. Is there anything else on your mind related to AI and academia or AI in general? The floor is open. I was going to ask if uh, you had an opportunity to uh, those tools. I think I sent you an email this week, a couple of new tools. 
was it email? Up. Was was it email or was it LinkedIn? Oh, it was LinkedIn. I know I briefly opened them and looked at them, but I don't think I looked at them very deeply. Uh, do you want to? Do you want to say what you like about them? Yeah. Well, that's funny because I just I was trying to find the tools. Oh um, yeah, it's Alexa. I'll put it in the chat. Oops. These are for a you're the second way. person who has sent me Cohere this week. I don't know if any of you are familiar with these, but Cohere is, um, I'm just waiting on it to load. Cohere is a product that allows you to use retrieval augmented generation, RAG, to get your, to get, to query a document and to pull out answers and solve problems. And so you can, my understanding is that you can create your own RAG with this model and use it for whatever you're, whatever you're working on. But yeah, it is cohere.com. And have you used it, Damon? Are you like? It's funny. I, I, one of the things that we've been trying to work on, or I've been, I shouldn't say we've been trying to work on, we is me as I, you know, and looking at, you know, uh, building a language learning model. I was on a presentation a number of months back with the American Bar Association, and they were talking about a, a model that was used for attorneys that they were able to basically take a case history, put in the model, and then take an attorney's brief, and then have the AI ask them questions about their brief. Mm -hmm. And then the AI then rated them on their performance. You know, and so I was looking at something similar to that, you know, mm -hmm. within my organization. Mm -hmm. So I've been trying to do some research on how to assemble those those type of things and to put all that information in there. So yeah. that's, uh, that's kind of the vein I'm running down now, in addition to trying to finish my dissertation. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, are you? Is your dissertation about legal? No, actually, no. It's uh, I'm looking more on the lines of I've always had this burr in my saddle for you know senior leadership and you know dealing with cybersecurity and the gap between the, the senior leadership and the actual culture of the organization that has to implement it. You know, the mm -hmm. guys in the computer room, you know, the ones that wear the don't wear the pocket protectors, but you know, you slide the code under the door. You know, and so you've got this major issue and. These are the folks that have to implement the tech. And there's often a gap, like a big gap, you know, where, oh, you know. Is, is it an EDD? Are you getting an EDD and like? Organic? Well, it's a PhD in cybersecurity leadership. Oh, leader. Okay. Yeah. I, I was thinking you must be in some sort of leadership. Because my, my MA is in leadership studies. And so uh, mm -hmm. it's always been kind of my thing. And so cause I've seen it you know, in the day to day. And uh, what happens a lot of times companies, you know, they bolt all, you know, the, the vendors are really good. And they bolt all these solutions onto their environment and the more things they bolt on the more hole the more holes they're leaving in their organization for bad actors to access yeah yeah i don't like to think about that i just want to pretend that doesn't happen <laughs> yeah i hear you yeah it's, it's getting kind of crazy and frightening i'm thinking that maybe we can use ai to help us solve the cyber mm -hmm. problem so hopefully bad guys are using ai too yeah well what else is on your mind anybody want to ask another question whether it's about this or something totally different i had another question but i was looking at you know I'm, i like frameworks you know there's mm -hmm. always like the writing frameworks you know i was thinking about that reverse engine that reverse outline trying to go down through and trying to determine how somebody wrote their their work is it mm -hmm. possible to do something like that where it could identify maybe if somebody was using some type of a writing framework you know like i know you know, there's, there's, like I know there's sometimes that there's one that I, I think it was, I think it was Neil Patel, he's a, he's a writer that you know, he does stuff. And one, he has one called Dilemma. It's like logic and exness and memorability and action, you know, because folks are writing other types of, you know, other types of work or, or you're trying to kind of make a point, you know, like you're trying to publish, not maybe like a major journal, but you're just trying to put something out there, you know, just for, to start some discussion or kind of poke the bear, you know, mm -hmm. and so I was just wondering, is there anything that you could do with the tool similar to that where it would either identify a framework maybe that somebody was using or kind of identify, I guess it would be pattern on it maybe. I don't know. I'm just trying to, sorry, just my brain going on steroids. Yeah. I mean, it's for sure, you know, a tool like we, t so for academic writing, we use the, the we often use the acronym MRAD, I M R. A, D, C, introduction, methods, result, discussion, right. conclusion. And then, of course, abstract is sometimes in there. But, yeah, I mean, our tools are, can easily find that kind of a framework, which yeah. is pretty basic to research writing. They can also find, like, we will often teach 
patterns like in a lit review, you could organize it according to themes. You could organize it like a funnel. So starting with the most broad topic and then getting funneling down to more and more narrow topics, which is what I was doing in, in my lit review. If you were like in your lit review, Damon, I could see you doing some sort of historical approach mm -hmm. where you give a little history of cybersecurity and the field and how it's developed. And so it can certainly pick up on those kinds of things. Yeah. It can pick up on argument and counter argument. It can pick up on patterns like problem solution versus compare contrast. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the, that's how I ended up, we ended up doing this as a business model is because everybody was talking about these things that, you know, can be generated with the AI. And I, in my mind, I immediately thought, well, if they can generate it, then they can analyze it, mm -hmm. produce it, then they can also tell you why they're producing it. I mean, hopefully, right? And and that proved to be correct. And so that's how we started developing these tools. It's like, well, oh, if it can output this wonderful writing, then it can also evaluate someone else's writing. And that's how we got to this point where we have these tools. And yeah, that in, the, in some cases, that is what they do. They're looking for a pattern. And if the pattern isn't there, then they know that something's missing. And we specifically give them certain patterns for certain and certain frameworks, like the lit synthesis mentor, which may be, that's, it could be part of the lit review co-pilot. We have, anyway, we have a tool called the Lit Synthesis Mentor, and it has like a checklist of things that a dissertation coach would be looking for. So, you know, just basic patterns like in each paragraph, is there only one citation or is the writer synthesizing multiple references in each paragraph? Things like that. I know one of the ones my advisor gave me was the Walton. It was from Walden University, like the meal plan. I know everybody's familiar with the meal plan. Mm -hmm. You know, the yeah, main the idea, plan. the evidence, the analysis, and the lead out. You know, I believe that was something in, you know, in, in each each section of your paper, making sure you're addressing those four, making sure you're addressing those four items in each section. Yes, we, the meal plan is definitely part of the Lit Review Copilot that I showed you. And it is one of our most popular functions. People love the meal plan because it's a formula. People who have difficulty with writing, they often will say things like, I just want a formula. I want to right. know what to write first, second, third. And the meal plan is a formula. So it's a really popular tool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. see how you can connect a, a, a formula to that mm -hmm. reverse outline when you're doing your own work. And that's kind of what I was, that's kind of what I saw that that's what I was thinking. Take one of those, uh, adopt one of those formulas with that reverse. I thought that was pretty sweet. Mm-hmm. Rick says, when you mention the reverse outline tool, you can also use something similar to reverse engineer a prompt from the output. Rick, do you want to say more about that or about reverse engineering the prompt? We tell our tools not to give the prompt. Oh, he <laughs> right. It's right. You're, uh, you're overseas. You're down under. Yes, it's very early in the morning there. Okay. Yeah. We tell our tools not to give away the prompt. And so if you try to ask a tools to tell you what the prompt is, they will say, I'm not allowed to tell you the prompt because the prompt is proprietary, but they will coach you through the process of the framework. Let's say you're looking at a specific framework or like, how do you do a reverse outline? You could ask that tool, what is your process for giving a reverse outline? And it will coach you and explain all the steps that it goes into that. This is similar to putting an article in for a summary, but asking how you might get this result. Ah, oh, I see. Like asking it to verify, how did you come up with this? Was it a heading that you noticed or was it a paragraph all on the same topic or some sort of verification method? Yeah, yeah. And that's really important because if you don't know why the tool is giving you information, then you can't validate the the truth of it so you really need to either ha like have that if you're doing a reverse outline of someone else's paper i encourage you to have that paper and be looking at it maybe on a different screen so that you can see okay are there any themes here that this tool is missing especially if it's something like a dissertation where you really are doing a deep dive and you need to cover everything you know when you're writing a research article there's some topics of course that you are, are going to cover in depth the ones that are central to your purpose 
purpose and in, in your content, but then there are others that are just kind of tangential. And with those, you don't necessarily need to know every single thing about it. You might just need to mention some seminal works. But if you're doing a dissertation, you really are proving your expertise. That is your, that is the measure of how you become an expert is a dissertation or a thesis. And so you really want to be extra thorough. And an LLM is a tool, but as you can see, with every tool we have, we always put this little at the bottom that says the guidance or feedback from the AI is designed to enhance and your existing expertise and knowledge. It should not serve as a replacement for your professional judgment. So it is a tool. It is not to replace your own training. It's to expand that and support it. All right. Well, it is time to go. It looks like another meeting is happening in this room. I see we're getting some, some of our employees joining. So anyway, yeah, if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me. I'm Kimberly at ac.org, or you can uh, use hello at Academic Insight Lab. We all will answer that one. You can find us on YouTube, LinkedIn. We're, we're kind of all over. So yeah, thanks for coming and hope to see you next week. Bye everyone. <laughs>